All right, recording is on. Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to um, BC 310. Uh, let's take a moment to pray and uh, we will get started. Could somebody please pray with us together? Um, and we will start. Can somebody pray? And we will start. Okay. Roshan, Ryan, how about, how about just pray with us, please? Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you and praise you for this wonderful and beautiful day, Lord. Thank you for gathering each one of us this day mm -hmm. for this uh, for these for these lectures and for these lessons, O oh Lord. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you in the name of Jesus in our midst, Lord. That whatever is being shared, each one of us, O oh Father, we pray that you'll impart to us your wisdom, your understanding and knowledge, O oh Lord, so that we can be good stewards of the things that you have entrusted to us, so that we can be good representatives of yours on the earth, O oh Father. Mm -hmm. Just pray that you will take a hold of Pastor Ashish, Lord, and just give him your wisdom and understanding knowledge to share with us and to teach us, Lord things that we need to know and learn to serve you in a better way we just thank you praise you and give you the glory submit this time in your hands in jesus name we pray amen amen and amen 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 thank you thank you everyone thank you thank you to the class today um chris i see your comment um about the lecture videos uh it's for this course but from last week is it that it's not opening is that what the problem is uh no it's 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 actually uh, for some other courses also faster uh, uh -huh. so it's, it's a it seems to be across uh it, it must i think it's across uh, courses okay okay all right i will i will have um have our team look at the yeah, thanks for letting uh, alerting us to this. I will have them look at it uh, right after this class. Good. Okay, so we started last week um, talking about church staff management, and again, I meant uh, like I mentioned last week. Um, um, I'm just calling it church staff management. Um, uh, in some other places, you know, you may call it employee management or staff management, or you may use different language. Uh, that's okay. Uh, here we just call, we just refer to them as church staff. Uh, you know, th these are people who are full time uh, with the church. Uh, so uh, we were just talking, you know, on various aspects. So as a Christian organization, uh, it could be we are talking about a local church organization, or it could also be any kind of Christian ministry, how should we, you know, take care of our, uh, take care of the people who are working full time for the organization, right? So that's kind of what we'll, we're talking about. And uh, one of the reasons we're talking about it is one is sometimes as pastors or as Christian leaders, we may not have, we may not know you know, how, what goes into taking care of employees. Uh, we may not know that, we may not be aware of it. So it's good to, you know, have some sort of understanding that, you know, you know, I need to look at all these things, but I need to take care of people who are working for uh, the church or the Christian ministry. So we're doing it from that perspective. So, you know, you need to cover all of this. Plus, uh, I think the, mindset is that we are all serving God, so we shouldn't expect to be treated well or, uh, you know, we shouldn't, you know, yeah, we're all sacrificing, we're all doing, serving God. And so, you know, so the mindset traditionally uh, in Christian ministry is uh, you, you don't really care for the people because anyway, we're all sacrificing for God. Whatever comes your way, you just take it, and so on. But I think that's a wrong mindset. We need to take care of 
the people who are serving God. Uh, because you know we are people. We have to live everyday lives. We people, uh, these people have families. They have children. Um, they have to educate their children. They have to, you know, all these practical things are there. Now, just because you're working for a Christian organization, a church, or a ministry, doesn't mean um, they should be ignored and sacrificed. You know, yes, we're going to honor God. We're making sacrifices, but. At the same time, uh, these are realities that need to be taken care of. So that's another thing we want to uh, we want to stress yeah, as we talk about this. So uh, let's just pick up from where we paused last week. Uh, maybe I'll just uh, quickly review, um, and then we will move forward. So church staff, just quick review. There are people who have paid full time, there are people who are paid part time, and then there are volunteers. Volunteers will talk about that separately in another lesson. Uh, we spent a lot of time last week emphasizing the hiring process. That means you want to make sure that you bring in the right people into the team so that you know the, the, the work can happen well, people can be served well. So the hiring process is important. Uh, uh, we encourage uh, you to have a good, robust hiding process uh, as part of the church or the Christian ministry. And I was just sharing some things that I normally do. Uh, you know, when when we are interviewing people, we we ask certain kinds of questions. We look at certain what we would call as red flags or warning signs, uh, and uh, we look at that. Then we also do background checks. Um, once we are done, we give them an offer letter. Uh, I've put up some samples there so you could look at it. Um, uh, you can definitely use them, just modify them and use them as you wish. Uh, we also give them our staff guidelines so they have an idea of uh, you know, what it means to be a staff of the church and what are their privileges, what are, their, what are the things expected from them, and so on. And then we also, when they when they get started, we have some basic things we follow. Uh, make sure they have a, a you know a computer or a machine to work on. Uh, they'll have their you know email ID set up. They'll have bank account set up. They'll have um, you know paperwork done to take care of the PF and take care of their health insurance. All those kinds of things. Um, they are given a welcome back. Uh, you know, usually we give them our APC jacket and <laughs> laptop bag and all those kinds of things. All these gentle things. A little, usually it's the first day of work. All these things happen. And then we started talking about compensation. That means we need to pay our people fairly to the best we can. Uh, this, of course, will vary from organization to organization, uh, depending on what the capacity is. But you know we have to make sure that they are paid well so that they can take care of their homes and families and so on. Um, and uh, how do you determine compensation? We talked about this. You know, of course, what can the organization afford? What are the levels of skills and competencies they are bringing in? What are the responsibilities they're going to carry? What is the leadership they're going to provide? Or what are they going to, you know, uh, what is the level of performance and objectives of the organization they're going to advance? Um, uh, how are they growing professionally? And how long are they with the organization? So these are some things we take into account. These are benefits, and these are the intangible benefits they would get, right? So till then, we covered last week. Um, let me just pause and see if there are any questions on this based on our discussions last week. Any questions so far before we uh, get into some new things? Everybody is okay? Any reflections, any thoughts, any questions that may come up later? All right, let's move forward. Uh, some more things now on uh, church staff management. Um, now we get into, okay, you've got people in your team, you've got people on staff. Um, important thing here is to keep them all motivated, right? That means they need to uh, be excited 
about their work. They need to enjoy the work. Uh, they need to give their best. Um, you know, uh, they need to be giving every every time they're doing the work every day. They need to give out their best, not half-hearted work. Um, you know, not what we say, not dragging their feet and doing it because they have to do it. They should enjoy it. They should give their best. Um, they need to, you know, they need to be creative, come up with new ideas, uh, with passion, be willing to go the extra mile. So basically, how do we keep um, employees motivated? And of course, this is applies to any organization, but we're, we're speaking specifically from the Christian church or the Christian ministry perspective. So I think from a church a church and a Christian ministry perspective, we have this big advantage that our work has a lot of meaning. You know, this is very this is a big motivator, right? It's meaningful work, meaning uh, what we're saying is we're not just you know creating a product that will be consumed and gone. But for us, we can we can always look at the fact that the work we are doing is going to touch lives for eternity. You know, we can get people saved, we can nurture people, we can help people journey through life. But you know, what we do can actually have eternal significance, and so there's huge meaning in that. Yeah. So uh, that. Is, is a very powerful motivator. And we need to keep reminding people that we are serving Jesus Christ. We are serving the Lord. We are serving the kingdom of God. Uh, we're not just serving, you know, some organization. No, we're serving God. We're serving his kingdom. And we are touching lives. And what we do to impact lives will last for eternity. Right? So that gives them a lot of meaning. Um, Another big motivator is giving them freedom to make choices, empowering them, right? So this is also a big struggle for us as leaders because, you know, and, and, I, and I struggle with it, is I want people to have full freedom. I want them to, be, but at the same time, I'm always thinking I don't want them to go off track, right? I don't want, to, I don't want them to do something wrong. Or, uh, you know, we've got to keep everything aligned. We've got to keep everything honorable, especially in the Christian context. Uh, you know, so uh, there is that. I want to have. I want them to have freedom, and yet I want them to hey stay on track. You know, don't go off and don't do something wrong, uh, which would then bring a bad name to the Lord and to us, and uh, so on. So. There is that tension always there. Uh, I, I admit it. Uh, that's why I'm always watchful, or to the best I can, I try to watch. Uh, I try to make sure things are okay, uh, things are staying on track. And yet, with all of that watchfulness, I also need to let go. You know, it's okay. Yeah, you make the decision. I respect your decision. Go for it. You know, you interact with people. You decide. You you know, they, they have that sense of empowering. So. It's a little tension, but that's the ultimate objective is let's have let's give them the freedom they need to make choices and so on. And uh, of course, we need to leverage competencies. What are they good at? So if we put people in places where they are not good in doing those things, they will feel very frustrated. We will also feel very frustrated. Uh, it's not going to work out. So we need to put them places where they have the competencies, which is what they're good at, which is what you know they have the skills for and which they will enjoy. So that's also an important thing, an important motivator. And they should feel like, hey, I can come to work and I can do this and I can do it well. And it's something I enjoy doing. It's something what I'm, you know, I, I, I have the skills for. Fourthly, um, we want to encourage personal growth. Uh, that means we want to help them learn, develop new skills and new challenges. Now, this is a problem when it comes to Christian ministry. You know why? Uh, in the corporate, like, you know, in general corporate, people are sometimes forced to, you know, grow. 
So we're forced to learn new skills, otherwise you'll get outdated, you won't have a job. The problem in church and in Christian ministry is um, sometimes people have the mindset that, hey, you know, the skills I had five years ago or 10 years ago, well, I'll just keep doing the work and, you know, everybody will just treat me nice and so on. And so there's no, uh, there's nothing that's challenging them to develop new skills, um, learn new things and uh, keep themselves, you know, updated. Nothing really challenged. So, um, uh, uh, so what we have to bring that in, we have to bring those challenges and we have to, you know, in some way push, motivate people say, hey, we have to do these things. So one of the ways we do it uh, at, at ADPC is for our staff, we have uh, like staff meetings every month. Uh, we be in those staff meetings, we talk about new things. We talk about these things that we, they should develop. Basically it's a skills development session. Uh, on various things. So for example, at this moment, last week, not last week, uh, last month, uh, in our staff meeting, we we were we learning about project management. Uh, so I told them, you know, this is how we do it. This is how we do a project estimation. This is what we need to do. And then uh, we gave out, you know, small assignments for everyone. Each would, you know, doing project estimation for this scenario, whatever it is, based on their area of ministry. Uh, and then next week, when we have our next staff meeting, everybody's going to present what they have developed their, you know, their project estimation, project planning, and estimation for that uh, work that was given. So it's kind of like forcing them to learn new skills. So we talk about this is how you do it. So they have to present it, and then so like that, we kind of you know we we kind of stretch them, you know, force them to learn some new skills. Uh, whether it's you know, whatever technology or so on and so forth because that is what we need to use in doing the work of the ministry right so we can't be using things that we did you know five ten years ago we have to use tools that are relevant current uh ideas and concepts and methodologies that are current so for that, we need to keep giving them input and stretching them. So that's something. But then, uh, while it is discomforting, maybe to some, to many people, it is actually very motivating. Because they're like, hey, I'm learning something new. I'm, I'm Personally, I'm growing. I am being encouraged to try out new things, learn new So That's a big motivator for most people. Now, some people can be intimidated by it. But most people would enjoy it. And if you make it fun, like we make it like an, a group activity, we make it like a team activity, then it's a fun thing. Uh, there's no pressure. It's uh, that learning becomes a, 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 a fun process. Uh, then, you know, people are very comfortable. They're also very motivated. A couple of things, I hope, uh, you know, you're, you're all with me. Uh, uh, a couple other things, you know, when we want to motivate our church staff, when people do a good work, you know, you highlight that, you commend them publicly. So either when we have a, you know, group meetings or maybe through email, uh, you can, hey, so and so did, here's an amazing thing, you know, this is what happened. So for example, you just highlight the work that was done, you know. So for example, when our media team does some really exceptional work, really good work, then I would send them an email. Sometimes I thank them personally. Sometimes I thank them publicly. Mm, on Monday, I'll send them an email. Hey, guys, you know, you did really great work with the video and with the graphics. Thank you so much. Or I might send it to everybody. Like, I think last week, I think it was last week. Yeah. Uh, I sent an email to everybody highlighting what, you know, what our IT team had done. You know, so we've search engine optimized our website. You know, over the last several months, over the last year, and so uh, today we have people from 196 countries using the resources on our website, uh, and then I gave them all the statistics. You know, we had so many 40,000 some downloads. Uh, we had over 40,000 people coming into our website through search engine, uh, and then so that becomes sorry, it was maybe like 60,000. I forgot the number. That's just this calendar year. That is just from Jan to September 15th. That seven and a half months, here are all the statistics, you know, just sharing with them, like, look, 
this is happening and everybody's contributing to this. A lot of people are contributing towards that. And then some lessons that we can take away. So, so when you share that, it really, wow, everybody feels excited. Wow, you know, what I'm doing is actually reaching almost 200 countries. Uh, you know, some people are doing video, some people are doing audio work, some people are doing publications work, but everybody's contributing. And that is serving people in 200 countries. And this look at the results. These are the number of people you know, or, or who are visiting and using the resources. So the, everybody feels encouraged. They feel like, wow, you know, we're doing something you know, meaningful. So you highlight the progress. It, it motivates people. Um, another thing is to involve people in decisions. So uh, this is uh, uh, very important, right? Now, there's also a problem in the sense that for most of us in in leadership, we like to make the decisions. Uh, you know, we like because for us we have a big picture. We can see things. We know what's going on. So we like to make decisions. Uh, but then, to engage and involve people means it takes time. Uh, it also means you have to deal with all kinds of questions and ideas, which takes time and energy. But then. Uh, when we, but then the thing is this: if we, as leaders, you know, you may be the pastor of the church or you may be the head of the ministry, if you're making decisions and pushing it, then it just becomes a command and control type of leadership. It's not a, a collaborative type of leadership, and then people just feel like, okay, I just have to do what the boss says, and they stop thinking. You know, they stop. Being involved, they become more like, I, I just have to do what I'm told to do. But when you involve them in the decision making process, you know the direction to go to, but you invite their ideas, you invite their contributions. And many times, uh, what that happens, what happens in that process is you actually come up with some great ideas because. As a leader, you know, you, you you kind of think like, yeah, okay, we have to go in that direction. But you may not have thought about this or that or so on and so forth. And then when, when discussions are happening, when people are involved in the process and they come up with some idea, wow, I never thought of it. That's a great idea. Oh, I never thought of that. That's a great idea. And you can put all these ideas together and the end result is most often much better. So as pastors, as leaders of Christian ministry, we need to, uh, engage people uh, in decisions. You know, uh, at the same time, you don't want to get sidetracked because sometimes people are not able to see the big picture. Uh, they may be caught up with some small, minor, minor detail, and then they may, you know. So you don't want to get distracted by those things, also. So there is that balance, and you need to. You know, the goal is let's be collaborative. And the, the beautiful thing is when people are involved, then they feel very motivated to go out and execute. Because they feel like, look, we made the decision together, so we are going to make it happen together. Right? It wasn't like somebody made the decision and is telling us to do it. No, we all decided. We all pulled in our ideas. Uh, all our ideas are there, uh, or at least most of the ideas that were shared, the or pre relevant ideas are there. We are going to do it. And they feel motivated to execute that decision. So it's very, very powerful. Um, and I think later on we will talk about this, uh, you know, this whole way of um, brainstorming. We call it brainstorming, right? So example, um, yesterday we had a, meeting uh, about 40 of us um, uh, of course we did it online because everybody's in different places um, our church staff and pastors uh, we were talking about you know how, just growing growing our locations growing the ministry and also uh, starting up multiple services and so on so it was all like okay everybody share your ideas you know what are the pros and cons what are the challenges how do we do this so everybody's just sharing their ideas so they know that you know everyone's been heard 
everyone's put in their ideas and then quickly wrap up and say, okay, this is what we're going to do, but uh, we will come back with more information, et cetera, and so on. So everybody's part of this whole process. And then, you know, we may have another meeting next week as a follow-up uh, uh, to what we discussed yesterday. So things like that. So people are engaged. All the staff, pastors are involved in the process. A um, few more things. Provide positive reinforcement. You know, you tell people they're doing a good work personally. So you can highlight process at a group level. Uh, but at a personal level, you talk when you, whenever you talk to people as a pastor, say, hey, you're doing good work. Thank you so much. Just saying a thank you to them, uh, you know, yeah, it will really encourage them. And also, whenever possible, do it in public. So you want to appreciate them in public, commend them in public. Uh, a big motivator is trust. If you trust the team and they know that you trust them, they will feel empowered. They will feel motivated. Now, of course, trust is earned. So, you know, we don't blindly trust, but trust is earned. Uh, and then when they know that you trust them, uh, they are highly motivated. Another important thing is to coach the people. So this is tough because when you coach people, sometimes you have to give them hard feedback. And I do this with my, with the pastors. You know, I, I, I just tell them. And for you know, one of the things, we the culture, we talk about culture. One of the culture we've created is give feedback. And, you know, we are open to giving and receiving feedback. But that's part of coaching. Because if you're not able to tell somebody that they are wrong, if you're not able to correct somebody, then coaching cannot happen, you know. And part of our culture here at APC is tell it like it is. You know, don't hold back. Just just tell them. You know, of course, sometimes it will hurt. For example, you know, last week uh, I was working with our pastors and uh, it, uh, we had had a meeting, we discussed something, he went out and he did something different. So I said, hey, we discussed this, but you ended up doing this. So I actually corrected him. And he told me later on, you know, when we did a call, he said, you know, I felt hurt when I was corrected. I said, yeah, that's, but then he realizes, but that's part of my learning. I said, yeah. Uh, and he understands where that correction is coming from, you know, and then he said, yeah, I learned my lesson and so on and so forth. So, uh, you know, so we have that happening. Uh, there was another pastor again, you know, uh, uh, he kind of, when, when he uh, presented a work, he only presented his work. Uh, and But then there were so many other people who were doing work and he never mentioned any of their names. So I corrected him. I said, hey, you see, when you spoke about it, you only mentioned about yourself. There were all these other people doing work. And as a leader, your first responsibility is to applaud others put yourself last that's what you always have to do uh so he like you know i corrected him and and he was like oh i'm so sorry but thank you for correcting me he realized you know where he went wrong and so so like this there has to be coaching um where you correct people you show them how to do things right and um, but then that's what motivates them they know that hey Somebody's watching, somebody cares for them enough to tell them what's right, what's wrong, how to grow as a leader, how to grow as a pastor, how to grow in what were they're doing. So in here in our culture at APC, we correct each other. We 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 we're not afraid to tell somebody, hey, that's that wasn't right, do it like this. And then we understand that it's all given with a good heart. Uh, of course, sometimes it's painful. <laughs> It hurts, but then that's part of our coaching and nurturing people, and and it, it motivates. Actually, it motivates people, saying, "Look, we are working together, and we meet, we want the best for each other." And then, of course, uh, a leadership that insp inspires is also important. So, what I've done here is just shared with you many different ways in which uh, we can motivate church staff and motivate people and this is so important because uh, the work of the ministry must not happen like some routine dead work no there's got to be life 
there's got to be passion there's got to be creativity there's got to be energy uh, in in what's happening by the people who are serving in the christian ministry um let me pause here take up questions um and uh, uh and uh, yeah let me see anything else any questions on this yeah shrikuma thank you sir sir i i want to know um like as you uh, as you were sharing um you know uh, so many things regarding to the feedback and uh, um motivation so as a leader um it's it's is easy for us to you know to correct others or and as a leader it's easy for us to motivate others but when it comes to our personal uh, challenges uh, how we can able to motivate ourselves and uh, how we can find our own mistakes and uh, that is something i just want thank you sir mm mm very very good question very good question so so as a leader right first thing i would say is this one of the one of the requirements of being in leadership is self governing and self motivation and when i say self motivation or self governing i don't mean we are depending on our own strength but we have to be able to draw our motivation and draw our accountability from god that's the first thing that means you know as a leader um because you're in that position everybody's looking up to you uh when you are facing challenges they may or may not you know you may you may or may not be able to go and tell somebody you know whom you are leading hey i'm going through challenges help me whatever that usually is very difficult right i uh, i'll share two or three points on this but anyway the first thing is you know as leaders uh, we have to have the ability to keep ourselves to govern ourselves and to motivate ourselves in god that means you go to god and say god is everything okay in my life and you are watching over your own life because nobody else is going to do that you know you have to watch over your life it's like what the apostle paul said you know i keep my body in subjection and i you know i discipline myself lest when i have preached to others i myself should be a castaway so paul is talking about self governing you know he is watching over his own life he tells the same thing to timothy in first timothy chapter 4 you know uh, uh timothy is appointed as a pastor and so paul tells timothy you know watch over yourself and over your teaching because in doing so you will save yourself and those who listen to you and i just paraphrased it but that's essentially what he writes to timothy so i'm saying so you're a leader but you've got to watch over yourself so that's self governing ability as a leader we have to have that and self motivation that means you will face challenges you will face so you need to go to god it's like, or i draw my strength from you i you know i i i i'm going to keep more, my my vision fresh i'm going to keep myself encouraged in god it's like what david did you know in first samuel 22 i think when uh ziklag the incident ziklag happened it says david encouraged himself in god even when all his soldiers were all discouraged david encouraged himself so that's one thing the second thing is you're a leader but everybody should in whom you are leading should know that you you welcome and you receive feedback or correction so anybody at apc like i'm i meaning our staff know that they can come and tell me straight if i'm doing something wrong and our staff do it so they come and tell you know hey this is we got to do it like this or we got to do it like that and of course they are respectful they know that i'm the leader but 
but they are not hesitant to come and tell me that something can be done like this, something can be done. So we have created a culture where the leader is not above the law, so to speak, right? The, everybody follows the same thing. So the leader is also open to receiving correction, receiving ideas, receiving input. And so, you know, I publicly will acknowledge if I'm wrong, I say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. That was a better idea. We will do that. So you've, what has happened is over time, we create a culture where people feel comfortable in sharing their ideas, sharing their feedback, even sharing uh, opinions that are different from what the leader would share. And therefore, the leader can be corrected. So that's the second thing, that as a leader, you are open to correction. Uh, another thing we have created is uh, we have an email called email ID called feedback at apcw.org. Basically, that's uh, open to anybody and everybody who, uh, who, who wants to give feedback. So we get emails from people, um, you know, all kinds of emails. People give feedback, and I take them seriously. And sometimes this feedback is addressed to me directly, pointing out something about me. And that email goes to everybody, so it's not hidden. You know, so when somebody sends, uh, I, so I'm just sharing this with you. <laughs> when somebody sends an email to feedback, it goes to all our pastors and all our staff. Okay, so that means it's not hidden. So it's everybody sees it. For example, on uh, this Monday, which was a couple of days ago. Somebody sent an email uh, feedback, and the email was correcting me directly about two things this person was noticed that I was doing wrong on the pulpit. So this person uh, is watching us online services. I don't even know which part of the world he is from. Uh, he didn't mention it. Uh, but he's, you know, he said, you know, I, I love the online service, I love the message, etc. But I have two things that I want to tell Pastor, and I want to correct him. And he mentioned two things, you know. Now, these are somebody could think that these things are silly, what he mentioned. But these were two things he was observing in the online service that I was doing wrong. And that email, of course, when when you send an email to feedback, it goes to the whole, everybody gets it. Everybody, so whole office, everybody gets it. So it's like an email correcting me directly, but it's gone. It goes to everybody. So what do I? What What did I do? You know, I responded. I responded to that person, but I also copied everybody. That means I let everybody know that I'm taking full responsibility. So I wrote back to him. I said, "Thank you for your feedback. Uh, thank you for helping us move towards excellence." Because he was correcting me. His motivation is for us to do better than what we are doing. So I said, thank you. And then I just asked him to kind of explain. I said, you know, I, I'm willing to learn. So please explain it to me. I'm willing to learn and I'm willing to, you know, work on it. So through that, so I purposely wrote back to him uh, and I said, yeah, you know, tell me if there's something I can do to get better, we will do it. But I also let copied everybody because I want, you know, BCC, I copied them in BCC so that I want everybody to know that as a leader, I'm not afraid to get feedback and I'm willing to correct myself in order to become better, right? So that's the second thing is creating a culture. And by example, you create a culture where as a leader, anybody can correct you. So this was some unknown person, even your own church staff can come and tell you things. And they do tell me, of course, they tell me respectfully and I take it and I correct myself. The third thing is, and this is not easy, but to have people outside that you can talk to. So this means having good relationships with some pastors who are older, uh, but who are outside the church. So that's the third thing. So I know pastors in Bangalore City. They're, they're, they're senior, that means they're older. Some couple of them, are, uh, let me say that they're retired. That means they're not holding positions of leadership. They've come out of it. They've 
you know, they've done their ministry. They're all in their seventies, and plus, they are still ministering, but not in you know uh, holding positions. They kind of stepped out of it. They have handed off their work to others, um, and so I have good relationships with them. Uh, we used to meet once a month. This was before the pandemic, so we have to restart those monthly meetings now, which we might do in you know maybe in November or something. We'll restart those meetings, but we we used to meet every month, once a month, just to build our friendships, a talk and so on, and then so you have good relationships. So what happens when it's needed? If you need advice, if you want to discuss, we just want encouragement. You know, here are pastors you can talk to. Right? They are they are senior, they're older, and they're good friends. We care for each other. We just talk to them, and you ask for it. You can ask for advice or input and so on and so forth. So these are these three things. Sorry, it was a very long answer to your question, but I hope I answered your question, Sri Kumar. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right. Um, very quickly, we'll answer Kennedy's questions before we move, move forward. Uh, Kennedy, uh, maternity leaves, breastfeeding offers, emotional offers, a case where a husband and wife, relative working together, uh, work at the direction. Okay. Yeah. So, of course, uh, maternity leaves are uh, for us, uh, at least here in India, it's dictated by our uh, labor laws. And so we just follow the labor laws. Uh, I think, um, I, I forget what it is. I think it's three months or six months maternity leave that we give. Uh, it's in our guidelines. I think it's three months paid maternity leave. Three months or six months. I forget. But whatever the labor laws are, we follow it. It's in our guidelines. Um, so uh, it, th those those laws are dictated to us by the government. So we follow those laws um, for maternity leave. Uh, for paternity leave, I think it's three days or something uh, for for the father. Then um, uh, other offers we don't have any, and they're not mandated by the government. So we don't have any other of, other than the maternity leave. Um, in the case when there's husband, wife, relative, yeah, so that is a very challenging situation. When you have both husband and wife working same organization. But uh, at least at ABC, we treat them like we treat any other employee. There is no, you know, no preferential treatment, anything. It's everybody's treated as a staff. Um, there are advantages and disadvantages of having husband or wife working in the same organization. Um, disadvantage would be usually they'll take leave at the same time, so both will be gone and so on. But if they're working in different areas, it doesn't matter very much. Um, the advantage, of course, is you know uh, both are highly would be high, generally would be highly committed to the organization and so on, uh, and. Uh, so that's a positive, but we just treat, they're all treated as staff. So there is no special preferential treatment to anybody. If they're anybody's relative or anything, they're all treated equally. Uh, appraisals are done, reviews are done separately and so on. So there's nothing, uh, no preferential treatment to anyone because they are married or blah. Okay, good questions. Anything else? All right. Uh, let me see if we can move forward a few more minutes, and then we go for a break. Uh, Kennedy, you have another question. Go ahead. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Kennedy. I think. Let me ask one with total due respect. It's not with any malice, because it's a very personal question. Eh? What kind of support does your wife give you when it comes to management or your work operation? Does it keep in or share whatever you decide as APC group or just give me some kind of direction because you know you operate from a family level because your wife knows you go to work and you come mm -hmm. back. Does mm -hmm. this give you any support or does she chip in in, in or do you share whatever emotional pressure you have or stress work stress? Thank you. Good, good, good question. So in the early years, I would say um, 
you know, from you know, Amy and I, we got married in 1995 till, let me say, till I think it was 2007. Um, we would be serving together, you know. So when we were in the U.S., we ministered together, and we came back here and we started the church in the early years. Uh, Amy was part of was leading worship, and uh, and so we would serve together. So a lot of discussion, everything would happen. You know, we would talk about church and ministry and so on. Um, and then uh, so that was those years, and then um, of course Amy. You know, did her medicine. So uh, in two, I think it was two thousand seven. Uh, I may be mistaken about the year, but I think it's two thousand. That Amy um, chose to go back and work in the hospital. This was after the children grew up, and you know they had uh, uh, they were little. They were going to school full time, so on. So then she was free to go back to the hospital and work. So from two thousand seven. Uh, Amy kind of stepped away from being directly involved with the ministry to doing more because she was more involved in the mission hospital. She was she works in a mission hospital, so she was focusing on that, and uh, that was well and fine. So you know uh, because even there, you know, you're serving people, you, know, you get to um, you know, of course, you're doing medical treatment, you're serving people. You, you look for opportunities to pray for them. You look for opportunities to minister to them. You can't do it. All the time, you know, because you have to be, you have to first provide the medical treatment, uh, and then when an opportunity comes, you do it. So there was a slight, there's a change in that. But Amy is still a trustee of the church. That means is one of the people on the board. So she would be still involved in that level as a trustee. So for, since that time, so things are a little different. So now, uh, when so one of the things we try to do is we need to keep family time as family time you know so we don't want to fill up our family time discussing church and we try to avoid doing that because family time is family time you spend time up with the family taking you know when our children were here it would be take care of the children we don't want to consume our time with discussing church matters so for the most part, we kept church away from interfering with family. Right? So church is, is happening, but when we are in, at home, we want to focus on the family. We want to, you know, spend time family, children talking about things that are of interest to them. So that was kind of what we did from the beginning. And so even now, uh, I do discuss a few things about church. But not much. We intentionally keep church away. Right? When we at home, it's more of family time. Right? I will discuss one or two things. You know, if if there's something I feel I need to discuss, I will discuss. But I don't talk about you know. So example, if in the office, if I'm there full day and I, I meet with eight different people in counseling sessions, I don't even. Talk about that. I don't mention who came and spoke to me. What? No, 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 not, nothing of that. Church, leave it there. But there may be some important decisions uh, because Amy's also a trustee. It's those things we would discuss, or you know, things that matter. We would talk a little bit, but we don't let that consume our relationship or consume family time. So to answer your question. Uh, you know, yes, my wife supports me. Now she's a doctor, so she's working in the hospital. She will share her experiences with with some of her patients and some of the things that she's going through in the hospital. She'll share with me, and I, you know, I'll we'll discuss some of it. But it's a little bit. It's not everything. Similarly, in my work as in the church in the past, we share some ideas. We discuss a few things, but we don't let our work, whether it's hospital or church consume our family time. I hope I answered your question. Kennedy. Or... Okay. Okay. Good. One last question and then we'll take a break, I hope.
these question answer sessions are useful to everybody. Uh, okay. Abraham, with church staff, do they work full time from Monday to Friday? So, Abraham, um, what we have is every person has to work 40 hours per week, minimum of 40 hours per week. Uh, uh, every staff has to work minimum of 40 hours per week. How they work, we leave it entirely up to them. Right? Some people who don't have to do anything on Saturdays and Sundays, they will work Monday to Friday. You know, so they work Monday to Friday, 40 hours, they will do 40 hours Monday to Friday. But most of our church staff have to work on Saturday and Sunday because you know we have services, we have conferences, we have events uh, usually happening on Saturday and Sunday. Most of so most of our church staff are actually busy on Saturday and Sunday. So they will take time off during the week. So they may take their Monday off or any day. We just leave it to them. Um, they, those who are working on Saturday, Sundays, they will take a Monday or a Tuesday or whatever time during the week they will take it off. The only requirement is every week, Sunday to Saturday, every staff has to work 40 hours. So how they work the 40 hours, we leave it to them. Uh, each one decides based on you know what they need to do uh, and so on. Is that okay? All right, so uh, everybody fills in their time sheet. Uh, I, I will show that to you. Um, we, have, we have a HRM, so everybody reports a time sheet there, and that's where they show that they have worked 40 hours. All right, good questions, thank you. Uh, we'll take a break now for 10 minutes, come back, and we'll go forward, okay? Thank you.